Joel for coming back for lecture number two. Uh, before I go on with uh, today's lecture, I'd like to announce that all lectures will be posted online in this link right here. It's my personal website in the University of Chicago. So you'll be able to download the lectures and go through them yourself in PDF format. So today, uh, we'll talk about all this different, this amazing diversity that we see with the supernova explosion. Last time we explored how do we get to a supernova explosion. Today, we will just look at this beautiful multitude of different characteristics, different shapes, different geometries, different properties for different supernova explosions. And I like, I like to credit myself for coining the term astrozoology. Because, you know, zoology is a, it's a field of, uh, it's a discipline where you have a variety of different kinds of animals and you look at different characteristics. So you can think about it as a zoo, as a supernova zoo, trying to understand the different properties of its different kind of supernova explosion. So, as I said before, stars evolve differently for different masses. Just to uh, revise what I said before, Stars that have masses like our sun will have a rather quiet lifetime and they will end their lives as white dwarfs after puffing out their external material. Massive stars, stars that are more massive than 8 to 10, 15 solar masses, 15 times the mass of the sun, will end up forming an iron core after going through the whole onion structure, which will collapse and produce a very energetic core collapse supernova explosion. Now, Another thing that I mentioned last time is that, besides the fact that most stars are uh, low regular mass stars, uh, is that stars leave compact remnants behind. So, low mass stars will leave a white dwarf, but even supernovae, once they blow up, there will be something left over in the iron core. And depending on the mass of the star that exploded, that could either be a neutron star or a black hole. This is the edge of physics knowledge. Physics dies in the black hole. Still trying to understand what's going on. So it's a pretty spectacular, very exotic objects, remnants, as we say, compact remnants that are left behind. Now I also want to mention another observational finding that actually, you know, we picked up on over the last 20, 30 years, is that stars like to burn in pairs. It's kind of like humans, you know. There's a few single people out there, but most people tend to find a significant other and you know, pair up. So, and that happens because stars are born in pockets of gas close to each other. So you can have something condensing in this area, but likely you will have something else condensing in a nearby neighboring area. So those stars will be entangled with each other. They will form a binary or a muddled star system. Actually, more than half of the stars we see in our galaxy, in the nearby galaxies, they're in binary, binary stellar systems. There's a few stars that are even in multiple star systems. You know, you've probably seen the Star Wars, and you, you've seen Tatooine that has two suns. You can imagine like, cases like that, where you've got three stars, four star, quadruple stellar systems, all together orbiting around each other. Now, that's very important, because coexisting with a star in your neighborhood will ch ultimately change the way that you evolve and the way that you get to a supernova explosion. So, so given that a large fraction of stars are low mass and a large fraction of stars are in systems, it's natural to expect that there will be a lot of low mass binary stellar systems out there. Symbiotic, to use a Greek word. I'll take the chance to use Greek words anytime I can. <laughs> um, symbiotic binaries. So those stars, uh, we will usually have a star that's about the mass of the sun, you will have another star that's about maybe also the mass of the sun, or maybe two times the mass of the sun, and they will be orbiting around each other for billions and billions of years. But this orbit sometimes is not going to be stable, which means they're either going to coalesce to each other or they're going to drift apart. Usually they coalesce to each other. And when they get to a very critical point, when they get really close to each other as they revolve around each other, it will start transferring mass from one another. And that's where you influence your partner's life. Uh, that could be bad company, too. Just because you have a, you know, a partner doesn't mean you're going to evolve nicely. There's some nasty partners out there. Bad things to do. 
Um, so under the right conditions, you can form white dwarfs produced by a star like our sun, but then you can have a, another star that still yet has not reached the stage of white dwarf. But it's a you know, big, puffy, red giant star. And what's going to happen is to get close enough, the big, puffy, red giant star is going to start transferring mass to the surface of the white dwarf. Now, if you remember from last lecture, white dwarfs are supported by this exotic uh, quantum pressure, which means that if you are not careful about adding mass to the white dwarf, it's going to become unstable. At some point, you're going to cross a threshold, and above that threshold, there's going to be a very energetic explosion, type 1 named supernova explosion. So, in the end of the day, and I'm gonna, I really want to chew on that today, they're all transients. We use, there's a whole discipline in astrophysics, we call it transient astrophysics. It's all about effects, it's all about phenomena that occur for a certain amount of time, then they go away. Supernova is such an example. You, when a supernova takes place, you will see a spot in the sky getting brighter and brighter and brighter, and then it's going to start getting cooler and dimmer until you can't see it anymore with your telescope. That lasts for about two weeks, depending on the supernova, one or two weeks. Sometimes it lasts longer, but it goes away. There is a variety of different kinds of transient phenomena that happen in the universe. You know, you could argue that when an asteroid hits a planet, that's a transient phenomenon because once, and we witnessed that uh, back in 2003, when the uh, comet Shoemaker Levi hit the Jupiter, at this point you see something bright happening once the once the comet was entering Jupiter's atmosphere, fired up, and then it, it was gone. That was a transient phenomenon. So this is how we define transient astrophysics. It's all about static phenomena that last for a very limited amount of time. Later on, now we're talking supernovae, which means that you know we got two weeks to study the thing, but there's phenomena out there, which I'm going to talk about in a later lecture, the gamma ray bursts, that last for fractions or a few seconds. So this, is become, this becomes an, an issue of technology. You got to have the right fast cadence instrument to be able to get enough information about what's going on within a tiny fraction of time. That's very challenging. We've done it. But those are, I really like those pictures because it kind of shows you the power of supernovae. It shows you that in reality, if you were to measure how much light, so all these bright spots you see in this galaxy here, right here, right there, right here, those are supernova that we detected. So there was nothing there before, and suddenly we see this really bright spot coming up. And if we were to measure how much light comes from this little bright spot in its case, and then we were to measure the entire luminosity, the entire light integrated for the galaxy it came from, we're surprised to see Wow, those stars kind of outshine their own galaxies. The, the light produced by a single explosion within this, within this little region of space is comparable to the entire light produced by a galaxy. Remember, a galaxy can have anywhere from 10 to 100 billion stars. So that means that the luminosity of this explosion is 100 billion times the luminosity of the sun. In some cases, even more. This is a really bright event, and that's very important for cosmology. I'm going to come to that later. Because the brighter an, an astronomical event is, the further away you can see it, which allows us to probe universe at really large distances. Actually, there was a Nobel Prize based on supernova back in 2011. There's so some folks that actually used these explosions at really large distances from the Earth to figure out the properties of the universe, the geometry and you know, the fate of the universe. We're going to come to that in a later lecture. So those are pretty, pretty bright, 100 billion times brighter than the sun. So, but occasionally, we get lucky, number one, because a few of these effects, a few, a few of these supernova occur in nearby galaxies, so we can actually see structure. It's not just a bright spot. It's really far away. What you really see is a bright spot that goes up, fires up, and then goes down. But if it's close enough, you can start looking into structure. Now, we, there has been supernovae that historically happened in the galaxy several billions, millions of years ago. And we can go back to the location where these things occurred and take pictures, see what's left over. We can look at supernova remnants. And this is a set 
of some of the most spectacular and most well-studied supernova remnants, most of them in our galaxy. That one is in a very nearby satellite galaxy, the, the Large Magellanic Cloud, LMC. But everything else around here is all supernova that happen in our galaxy. For example, this is the Crab Nebula. Kind of looks like nebula, but what this was, was, there was a star here that blew up. And that's what's left over as the star slowly um, disperses in space over time. <clears throat> and that's a type of supernova. That was a different kind of supernova than this one. You can see already, just by looking at those two pictures, you can see some differences. You can see this is pretty round. It's pretty well, I mean, it's not perfectly spherical. I'll keep coming back to that. But it's more spherical than this guy. This guy has more structure, filamentary structure, more complicated geometry. Uh, and same holds for, for this, this guy right here. Now, that's another roundish one. Maybe, that, maybe just even looking at the shape of what's left over from the supernovae, we can tell something about the stars that produced them in the first place. Uh, people have spent hours and hours trying to understand this structure in their computers. Why? Why do you have a closed spherical star in the end it's going to look like that? And it, all, it all goes back to what I told you uh, during the first lecture when I showed you the simulation that stars are not really spherical. They're closed, but there's, there's perturbations inside stars that exaggerate when an explosion takes place. And eventually those big loops and those big uh, voids you see between those filaments, they're the leftovers from this eddies, uh, cyclonic motions that I showed you before after the star explodes. It's, so spherical, the breaking of spherical symmetry has visible effects in what's left over in the supernova explosion. So another thing, obviously, is that we are able to deeply study, to deeply look with our telescopes what is hiding in the center of this uh, remnant. And in some cases, we discover something. You know, we see a neutron star. Right here, the bright spot in the center of this one, it's a neutron star. Neutron stars are really exotic, compact objects supported by quantum pressure that have really high, in some cases, magnetic fields, and they rotate around the rotational axis in a pretty, pretty high rate. You know, it's funny, when they first discovered uh, pulsars uh, back in the 60s, they, uh, turned the, they turned them LGMs, little green men. Yes, sir. Excuse me, are these actual pictures or computer generated? No, those are actual pictures. These so, are actual pictures. So the way, if you, if you were to look with your naked eyes, you wouldn't see those colors. You will see pretty much like gray, white, and, uh, and black. But it, what we do is we take real pictures with telescopes at different filters, and okay. then combine the filters just to understand. To enhance. Yeah. Exactly. Well, not just to enhance, but different uh, filters have different sensitivities to different radiation. So by doing that, you can actually say, oh, well, it's more likely that this uh, you know, brownish material here is uh, hydrogen versus this bluish material is something else, for example. So we can actually tell something about the, the structure and the composition of, the, of these events. So yeah, so when they first discovered uh, pulsars back in the 60s with radio telescopes, um, Jocelyn Bell, a great uh, you know, astronomer back in the day, she it looked pretty intelligent. And she looked through her telescope, and the signal went like that. With a certain period. So you look at this thing, and you say, wow, look at this. It's this very periodic. It's very consistent. There's got to be intelligence behind it. So people start freaking out. Oh, we found, we found aliens. No, no, no. <laughs> so it turned out it wasn't aliens. No. It turned out it was uh, those neutral stars that were rotating in a way that sometimes it would point towards your direction, beaming at you. And then they would rotate back towards you over and over again. And that's exactly the signal <laughs> they produced. Uh, but in some cases, most, more specifically in this guy, for example, uh, <clears throat> Tycho Supernova, because the great uh, astronomer from the 15th century Europe, Tycho Brahe, discovered it. We can't find anything in the center. We've looked. We, we've used our best telescopes to date, our best technology, and we can't find a remnant out here. So what happened here? Did the star completely disrupt this film? Is there something else? Are we still not, don't, maybe we don't have the technology to see anything 
uh, at this point, but we're pretty sure we should be able to. So that's been a puzzle for a long time. Why is there no remnant here? And that turns out to be the difference, the main difference between what I'm going to talk about type 1A and type 2 supernova explosions. One of the main differences. There's more. One thing that I touched on last time is that really light is all we have in astrophysics. It's not like we can hop on a spacecraft, you know, take a weekend trip to a supernova, collect some, collect some samples, and come back to Earth and be like, okay, yeah, I just thought I was going on. No. We, we only have light. But light is pretty powerful because we can combine it with our knowledge of physics and how light is produced, how it's propagated, and we can use light very effectively to deduce the properties of these events. There is three main areas of observational astrophysics when it comes to light. So one thing you can obviously do with light is just measure how much it is. You can just measure how bright the thing is and how it changes over time, how the brightness changes over time. By doing so, you can create a very useful plot uh, in transient astrophysics that we call a light curve. This is an example of a supernova light curve. It's basically what I explained to you in a hand wavy way earlier. Initially, there was nothing. You couldn't see anything in this position. But then suddenly, something brightens up, reaches a peak, and then starts dimming out. And then, after some point, you can't detect it anymore. Uh, those are called supernova light curves, and they help us understand some of the broad characteristics of supernova, because different shapes, different luminosities imply different properties for the star that exploded in the first place. But you can do what's revolutionizing, you can do something even better. You can actually take light and break it down to its individual components or wavelengths. You can do spectroscopy, you can take the spectrum of light, a rainbow, it's kind of like uh, you know, drops of uh, uh, humid air break down in the solar light into a beautiful rainbow. You can do the same thing with astrophysical objects. And that turns out to be very powerful. In my next slide, I'm, I'm going to dive into that a little more. And you can do other things like polarization. You know, maybe some of you own the polarized Ray-Ban glasses, and you can, you know, you, you can notice that it really helps with blocking UV radiation. It really helps with just allowing the amount of radiation you need to come to your to your eyeball. But we can do similar things for stars and for supernovae, and that is a very powerful tool. I'm not. This is just what it looks like if you analyze it in your astrophysical. Uh, environment, but the main important thing about polarization is it tells you a lot of things about the shape of things in astrophysics. So by just measuring it, you can tell whether something is spherical, or it's elongated, or it's disc shaped. This is the main thing I want you to take out about polarization. It's a very complicated process. Uh, so I'm just going to do a quick review of spectroscopy to just give you an idea of what happens when we actually take a stellar spectrum and we analyze it, and we try to induce properties of supernova just based on that. And this cartoon image that I have here, it's basically what I explained before. If you were to replace the prism with a drop of water, that's what you would produce the rainbow color. So in reality, we can make sophisticated prisms or spectrographs that allow us to break down light into its individual colors and look how bright in each little part of the, of the in, in each color, a certain object is. And that's very important. Because it gives us a lot of information about its temperature and about its composition. And this is what I'm trying to outline here with the image. So when light is passing through a, an object, a cloud, you know, it's it's been absorbed, it's been weakened. You know, you've all you've all experienced cloudy days. Light from the sun gets weakened and it looks darker. Same thing happens in astrophysics. When light is produced in the core of a supernova explosion, it has to go through the supernova ejecta, the debris of the supernova, until it gets out and reaches your telescope. But you can use this to your advantage because you can analyze the light and figure out, OK, what is the composition of the material that the light went through before it got to us? So two important features we see when we take spectra of astrophysical objects is the so-called spectral lines. And there's two lines. And we call them lines because they're pretty narrow. Uh, I'll show you a picture of the spectrum. I think I showed you in the previous slide. This is how the spectrum looks like in the star. And those are the lines, you know. You see the line right here, a line right here, a line right here. Some of those lines go up, and some of 
those lines go down from the main baseline. The, the lines that go up, we call them emission lines, and the lines that go down, that's a very move line, you lose light at those lines, we call them absorption lines. For example, in case supernovae, we see a lot of absorption lines, because as I said before, light has to go through the ejecta, and it gets absorbed before it gets to us. So we see a lot of absorption lines that are characteristic, important that we can do this in our laboratories, characteristic of the material that absorbs light. So if it's carbon, for example, if you got a carbon gas, it would absorb light at a different wavelength than if you had an oxygen cloud, or a hydrogen cloud, or a helium cloud. So you can use this to, to say, what's the composition of this material? But then it, there's cases out there, like for example our sun, where you simply have a very hot gas, and it's hot enough that it can emit, emit its own radiation. It's not like it absorbs some other source of radiation. It emits its own radiation. In this case, you get the emission lines, which are also characteristic of the composition of the object that emits the light. So if you can see hydrogen lines, and you can say, oh, there's a lot of hydrogen in this star, or in the supernova. This is how we figure out compositions for supernova. That's very important. Uh, and this is, again, examples of supernova spectra. I don't want to get into the jargon, the specifics, but what we usually do is we measure how bright it is in a certain way, in a certain color. How bright it is in blue versus how bright it is in, in, in red versus how bright it is in yellow. This is basically what you see here. And when I, when I use the terms blue, red, yellow, what I really mean is wavelength in astrophysical terms. Uh, and in most cases, you will see a pretty smooth structure, you know, more or less. It looks like that, but on top of that smooth structure, you see the lines. There is an absorption line right here. There is an emission line right there. And those are, again, very characteristic to the material that produces them. And that's how we can tell what supernova made. So when we do this for the supernova zoo, for the different kinds of supernova explosions, we see, oh my god, those are pretty diverse objects. It's not, they don't share the same characteristics across. You know, some of them will show a lot of silicon. So you see this pretty you know, deep absorption line, which is characteristic of the element silicon. They're very silicon rich. Some of them will have less of that, but will have more of hydrogen. So you see, they're, they're made out of different materials, different compositions. They're different brightnesses. You start revealing the complexity and the diversity of the characteristics of these events. Now, the definition of the two types of supernovae, type 1a, which is a total different physical system than type 2 core collapse supernovae, is basically that. You know, type 1 supernovae do not show any hydrogen in their spectrum. Zero. They do show a lot of uh, silicon sometimes. Type 2 supernovae, they do show hydrogen and helium. So, Type 1, hydrogen, type 2, sorry, type 1, lack of hydrogen, type 2, presence of hydrogen. So let's, let's talk a little bit about type 1 supernovae. Uh, again, you don't have to digest this complicated set of uh, spectra, but what it basically is, is different spectra from different supernovae. So what you see here is the name of the supernova. Usually, the way we name supernova, it's always uh, a year that it was discovered, 2003, for example. And then we start using the alphabet, A, B, C, D, F, G. When we run out of letters, we put another letter, A, 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 B, A, C. But now, with the modern uh, technology that I described earlier, which we can discover thousands of supernovae on a daily basis, we really run out of letters. You know, we have three or four letters following uh, the year of discovery. So it's getting pretty exciting. But you can see, uh, one thing just by looking at the shape of these lines, but they're pretty similar for type 1A supernova. And that's what defines a class, sharing similar characteristics. Type 1A supernovae turns out to be the most homogeneous class supernova explosions that uh, we've seen uh, within that class. So the broad characteristics of type 1A supernova is that we don't see hydrogen, of course, that's the definition of type 1. Uh, but later on, we see intermediate, as we call them, intermediate mass elements because they're not 
as large as hydrogen or helium, but they're not as scary as ions in between. So usually those elements are oxygen, neon, magnesium, sulfur, calcium. Later on, as you follow the evolution of the supernova, so what happens is you will, uh, you know, you will see the light here, it will get brighter, and then it will get dimmer. And as you measure this, in each, in each one of these epochs, you will take a spectrum. And then you will see how the spectrum, that line, changes over time for the supernova. Now, think about it. As the supernova expands and cools, it becomes more opaque, which means that you can look deeper into the star. Remember the onion structure? So if you had a massive star exploding, for example, the first elements you would see if you take spectra would be dominated by hydrogen, because that's the outer layer of the onion structure. And the deeper and the more you look, as the supernova evolves down here, you will start seeing the elements that correspond to the inner layers of the star, iron. So in this case, in Tapuani supernova, later on, we we'll see a lot of iron for them. And that tells us something about the explosion properties that come to later. Now, we also want to know how old are supernovae. Why are type 1a supernova so homogeneous, so different than type 2 supernova? Is there, what sets them apart? Is there a difficult star, a different system that, that explodes? Turns out, yes, there is. Uh, I started my lecture with binary systems. Turns out type 1a supernova are related to the evolution of binary systems. Whereas type 2 supernova are related to single mass, mass evolution. So, it turns out we usually tend to discover type 1a supernovae away from the center of the spiral arms of the galaxy they're in. Which means, you know, it takes a long time to drift away from a spiral arms where most of the stars are born. The vast majority of stars in a galaxy are in the spiral arms, okay? So it takes time to drift away from that all the way to the edge of the galaxy, billions of years. That gives us one hint. Type 1a supernova come from pretty old stars, pretty old stellar populations. One hint. Second hint is that we see a lot of these events in a type of a galaxy we call elliptical galaxy. So you've all seen pictures of galaxies. You know, some of them have spiral arms. Again, those are spiral galaxies, and my, my art uh, is horrible. Uh, but some of them are pretty elliptical. You know, they're not as, as cool as those guys. You know, they're more. Uh, those are older, older stellar populations. And we see a lot of type 1a supernova in those really old primordial, uh, if you may, galaxies. Again, second hint that they come from an older population of stars. So, the star that expl explodes forming the supernovae, as I'm pointing out here, has to be very old, billions of years old. That means that it must be a long-lived star, which maybe means that maybe it's a low-mass star, because as I said before, Lower mass stars live longer than massive stars. They consume their fuel at a lower rate, more conservatively, as massive stars do. So, let us go the type 2 supernova. Now, within type 2 supernova, I, I remind you that type 2 supernova are the ones that do not show, uh, that, sorry, that do show hydrogen in the spectra. I always confuse them. Uh, we see, within that class, we see a lot of diversity in spectra. So that class has a lot of sub-classes that I'm going to talk about. So type 2 supernovae, we can find them in these spiral arms of galaxies, which means that they come from a younger stellar population. There was no time for the star to drift away. It just died pretty much in the site where it was born. So they lived shorter, which means that they probably come from a, mass, from a more massive stellar population. That's another hint that we have. We never see them in elliptical galaxies. Elliptical galaxies do not have young stars. They are all star populations. Another thing, those must be stars that live short. Therefore, they must be massive. So again, as I said before, more mass, more fuel, but you vary at a high rate, and therefore you live a shorter life. Um, so we expect such stars to evolve and form iron cores, as I said in the first lectures. And then obviously explode by a very energetic, energetic uh, supernova explosion, leaving behind a neutral star or black hole. The main differences between type 1 and type 2 supernova are the presence of hydrogen and stellar populations. Type 1 older, type 2 younger. 
Type one, lower mass. Type two, higher mass. But again, as I said, as I touched on before, there's subtypes. That's why I call it supernova astrozoology. So many different types of supernova. You got giraffes, you got elephants, you got all kinds of stuff. So those that do not have hydrogen in the spectra, the type ones, that doesn't mean they're always low mass. Now it's getting confusing, right? So I told you before, oh, you know, hydrogen poor, the lack of hydrogen in type one supernova means older stellar population, lower mass star. Well, it turns out that massive stars sometimes, especially the members of binaries, which most of them are, will lose their outer layers. So they will lose the hydrogen layer, which is always the outer layer. Sometimes they will even lose the, the layer right behind, right below hydrogen, the helium layer. So once they lose both the hydrogen or the helium layer, they will, they will have a carbon oxygen exposed. How do they lose it? Well, they transfer it to a companion star. And when those stars explode, it's not like they, they come from a smaller, lower population star. It's just that you don't see hydrogen because it's not there. It's been removed by the companion. So when they blow up, they are massive, but they don't have hydrogen anymore. We call those supernova type 1 BC supernova. The difference between B and C is that type 1b supernova do not show hydrogen, but they show helium. Type 1c supernovae, they show neither hydrogen or helium. They're the more negative ones, if I can use that expression. Uh, so you will see some examples of spectra here for type 1, type, uh, type 1b, and type 1c supernova. You see, for example, a type 1c here, we don't see any hydrogen. Uh, anywhere we expect, we, we know where to expect to see hydrogen in terms of wavelength, and we don't see it. It's out. Now, I'm really interested in this subclass because it turns out that this subclass of supernovae, the type 2M supernovae, produces some of the most luminous supernova explosions in the universe we, we have discovered, the superluminous supernovae. We'll come back to that later. What does that mean? So, type 2 means they have hydrogen. The M stands for narrow, which means that if you look at the spectrum, the spectrum of this uh, supernova, you see this really prominent narrow hydrogen emission lines. This is it. That guy, it's very prominent compared to the rest of the spectrum. Very narrow. Well, how did how that happen? Why, why is that line there? How is it formed? What does that mean? Well, it turns out that supernova are, do not usually die in clean environments. As I said before, sometimes they lose their outer envelopes. They lose the hydrogen the helium envelope. So sometimes what happens when supernova explode, you've lost your outer envelope. It's, it's right here. And then when you explode, you collide with this outer envelope. This collision is very violent, produces a lot of very energetic blast waves that transfers through matter, depositing a lot of energy. I'm going to come back to that later. But those are supernova that are powered by the interaction of the supernova with what's left around it before the star died. Those are interacting supernova explosions. Now, I said light curve, spectra, and polarization are the three main tools we have to understand the nature of supernova. Let me touch on the supernova lighters a little bit. So, supernova explodes, the matter expands, and over time it gets cooler and it gets more opaque, more transparent, I'm sorry. So as it gets more transparent, you can see deeper in those layers. Uh, so, and you can see the different compositions that reveal themselves within these uh, layers. Most supernova will expand out to about a radius of about 100 times the orbit of the Earth around the sun. That's a pretty large radius. If I were to put it in centimeters, it's 10 to the 15 centimeters. It's one followed by 15 zeros centimeters. It's a pretty, pretty, pretty big radius. Most of them will peak, and when I say peak, they will reach their maximum luminosity within one or two weeks after they explode. Now, in type two supernovae, that contain hydrogen, most of these supernovae come from massive stars, A, 
15, 12, around this range, solar masses. And those stars tend to be large, red giant stars that have retained their hydrogen envelope. So those stars take a longer time to shine than other stars because simply they have more, you know, more extended hydrogen all the way out. So when they blow up, they produce yet another subtype of supernova we call it plateau, type 2 plateau. Type 2 because it has a hydrogen, and P plateau because after it shines, it stays, the luminosity stays constant for quite a you know, significant amount of time before it finally drops. So again, you start seeing how diverse, even when it comes to light years, not just spectra, those events are. Some of them are not neither follow the plateau, neither drop at a certain rate. They drop faster. What are they? Type 2 L supernova. We call them L because that decline looks linear. It's not really. It's just a horrible term that we've been using for years. Uh, so the ejected matter cools as it expands, exposing the bare core of the star. And it radiates energy. So there has to be an energy source in the center. The luminosity needs to come from somewhere. And the question is, how do you produce the luminosity? What is the mechanism that powers supernova explosions? Well, as I said before, most, more supernovae produce iron in their cores before they collapse and they explode. Now, once they reach the point of collapse, the iron will collapse and it will generate a very strong blast wave that will start running through the star to blow it up. And that blast wave carries a very high temperature and energy with it. What happens if you have a material and you suddenly raise the temperature up by several billion degrees? The material is going to burn. It's going to be a really energetic chemical reaction. It's going to burn to something else. So that's exactly what's going on. If you imagine the layer the onion structure of the star, you will have the iron core that will explode, will produce this blast wave. The first material that it will meet on the way out will be silicon, because that's the, the material right around the iron core that's left over. Silicon will be burnt, forming a very special element, nickel, 60, nickel 56. Now, nickel 56 is really the heart and the core of powering most supernova explosions. Nickel 56 is a radioactive element, which means that as soon as you produce it, it's unstable. It's not going to stay in this state for a long time. It will radioactively decay to something more stable. If you remember uh, from a previous lecture, I showed you a valley of the elements, from hydrogen to iron, and then to heavy elements. Turns out iron is the most stable element, so Lower mass elements tend to combine to get to iron and form an iron core. Heavier mass elements, like nickel, uranium, radioactive <laughs> materials, turn to break up to get back to stability, to form iron cores. So this is the so-called iron stability value. Everything wants to become iron in the end, if you give it enough energy, or if you take enough energy from it. Uh, so the supernovae. Will, after the explosion, will form a lot of nickel 56. When I say a lot, take the mass of the sun, take one tenth of the mass of the sun, 10%, and that's how much nickel will be. That's a lot of radioactive material, which will then decay radioactively. So, whenever radioactive decay takes place, very energetic radiation is produced, gamma rays. So, and again, gamma rays are part of the spectrum. So, the spectrum starts with really wimpy, low energy radio waves that we're using to, you know, to do cell phone communication and all this kind of cool stuff. But then as the energy goes up, you have optical. This is the reason I see you. The reason we see each other right now is because our eyes are sensitive to a very, very narrow part of the spectrum. But there's a lot of information well beyond that. Ultraviolet, x-rays, and finally gamma rays, which are the most energetic part of the radiation. And those those radioactive uh, reactions produce gamma rays. So those gamma rays, what, what are they going to do? They're going to be produced in the center, and they're going to propagate 
that are going to propagate around in the surrounding, expanding supernova material, the supernova injecta. I'm, I'm going to be using this term, the debris. And once they get there, they will heat the expanding material, and they will heat it up. It will rise the temperature. That's why supernova side. You heat this expanding material with this radioactive emission produced by the decay of Nico 56. Well, that's already a hint why you see supernova with different uh, luminosities, different peak luminosities. It's very safe to assume that supernovae that are brighter have more nickel, they produce more radioactive material. They heat, they reject them more efficiently. Supernova that are dimmer, they produce less nickel. In general, type 1a supernova are brighter because they produce about 0.5-0.7 solar masses, again, solar mass of the mass of the sun, 50 to 70 percent of the mass of the sun of nickel 56, whereas core collapse type 2 supernova produce only a tenth. Therefore, it always tends to be the case that type 1a are brighter than type 2 supernova explosions. And now, Really fast polarization. I really like very much, by the way. I'm <laughs> so I have to use it. Uh, so polarization. So what is light? What is light in the first place? At the very finest level. Well, you probably heard all the quantum mechanics, light is wave-particle duality. In some experiments, light behaves as as a wave. In some other experiments, it behaves as a particle. If I if I sign my laser beamer. On a mirror, it's going to reflect back. That's kind of like a particle-like behavior. It's like playing pool. You know, very, it, it reflects off in a certain angle and comes back to, the, to a different direction. But in other experiments, if you shine light through two very narrow holes, very, very tiny narrow holes close to each other, from the other side, you will see ripples of light. You will see a wave-like behavior. This is, this is the very... This, revolutionized physics, revolutionized quantum mechanics, the nature of light, and why, so why matter in this very fine subatomic level can sometimes behave as a, as a particle, some other times behave as a wave. So in astrophysics, we'll have to deal with that. But usually, we grasp more, most of the information by the wave side, the wave personality of light. So if you look at the wave, uh, uh, structure of light, it really is an electromagnetic wave, as we call it now in, in, in physics jargon. What it is, is basically a magnetic and an electric field intertwined together that oscillate over time. As you can see in this picture right here. Now that means you can use a special instrument, we, use a, we call a polarizer, to just isolate a certain direction of oscillation. So if you use a Polaroid, a Polaroid filter, that has this vertical, vertical uh, uh, lines, then you only isolate this direction of light polarization. You can rotate it and isolate a different direction. Well, by doing that, why is this important in astrophysics in the first place? Well, by doing that, you can figure out, by measuring how polarized the light is, you can figure out what the shape of the surface that it came from is like. Because the last, surf, the last point of the surface that the light is emitted from supernovae will carry along, the light will carry the polarization from that last shape. And by measuring the angle, by rotating this polaroid and figuring out where it gets brighter, in what angle, you can say, oh, you know, in this angle it gets brighter, in this angle it gets dimmer. And you can figure out the shape of, of, of uh, astronomical object this way. So when we do this, for supernovae, we see that type 1a supernovae tend to be more spherical, they tend to have a more spherical shape. Whereas type 2 supernova explosions that are far away, that we can't see their structure. Earlier on, I showed you a slide with structure with supernova remnants in our galaxy, which you could even visually see the difference between the shapes spherical versus football shape. But for, even for supernova that are far, far away, that we can't really see their structure, but we just see a very bright dot that goes up and down. If we measure their polarization, we can actually figure out their shape. We can deduce their shape. In type 1, supernovas seem to have spherical shapes, as the picture I showed you before. Type 2 seem to have a more complex geometry, more elongated shape. This is why polarization is important. So, again, go back to the screen pictures. So type 2 supernova, 
from massive, short-lived stars. We saw a lot of structure, filaments, voids, pretty complicated. Now, I love this guy. Everybody in the supernova community loves supernova 987A. I was born in 1986, so I was one year old when that happened. I don't remember much. But this is the this, this happened really close to us. It happens in a satellite neighbor galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud. So we were able, with high accuracy, over here since 1987, we're still following. We still see it. We still measure its properties. And when I get to that lecture, I'll show you a movie of how it's evolved over the last uh, 18 years or so. So, so uh, what you see here, in this case, look at the structure. You see a ring of material that's breaking down into bright spots. In the center, if you look closely, you will see there's some nebulous, elongated material. How do you explain the shape? Why, why does it look like that? I'm going to get back to that when I talk about the a But the main point here is that both of these supernovae are produced by single massive stars that exploded. And all these supernovae, and I need to press it, right? are produced by type 1 supernova, by white dwarfs that explode. Yes, sir? Look, the small white dots outside the supernova, are they, can you see them because of the supernova? Because of the those light? white dots you're talking about? Would you see them otherwise? Yeah, those are background stars. So those are stars in our galaxy that just happen to be in the same field of view. And are they illuminated by the supernova? Most of them, no, because they're really far away. I mean, they're, they are, they, they, uh, you can see them in the same picture, but it doesn't mean they're the same distance. Does the supernova ever illuminate an object? It can. Galaxy? It can. I'm, and uh, that's the whole point of type 2 end supernovae, which I'm going to come to. Okay. But, yeah, right. but, uh, yeah, but it can under, under certain conditions. Uh, so, yeah, those are background stars in our galaxy. And type 1 supernova again, well more round than this. You can even see it with your naked eye. Those are some really cool historical supernova, first discovered by ancient civilizations. For example, 1006 was discovered by the Chinese. Um, Tycho, Europeans, uh, discovered in the 15, supernova of 1572. Kepler, 1604. Kepler was a student of Tycho's, uh, and some more modern ones. So again, you can see uh, different morph morphology between the two types. And once we have a lot of events, we can start doing statistics and demographics. The Supernova Census Bureau is going to get together and decide what do we see more than something else. So, for example, uh, supernova occur in different rates in different galaxies. I talked before about how type 1A supernova drift away from the spiral arms of galaxies, or they tend to occur in elliptical galaxies. Type 2 supernovae tend to occur in the spiral arms of galaxies uh, when they're younger. Uh, so there's different rates of explosions for different galaxies. Different types of galaxies have different populations of stars, and different densities of stars. So they will produce different kinds of supernovae. So we see that the most active supernova producers are the spiral galaxies, kind of like our galaxy although we're overdue. But galaxies like our galaxy seem to be the most active producers of supernova, one in every 20 years. Now you have some irregular shaped galaxies that are actually very rare. They are, they are uh, more often than our galaxies, but there are also not many of them out there. So there's way more spiral, spiral galaxies than there's irregular galaxies. But when an irregular galaxy uh, is somewhere we've been seeing, it will produce a lot of luminous. And that's a key thing. Very luminous. Somehow, the most luminous supernova are associated with this irregular galaxy. I'm going to come to that later. And then, of course, you have ellipticals, very old star populations. They're pretty much not active at this point. They will produce three supernova every 100,000 years or so. And then you can start breaking down all the supernova samples you have in different types. Most of them come from uh, type 2 supernovae, the ones that, uh, that lack a uh, Hydrogen. Uh, and then it's split between type 1 B6s and type 1A. So type 1A is really just a quarter of all these supernova type explosions we see. But then you can do an individual type of supernova and see what subtype is more dominant. 
So type 1A supernova, most of them are normal. There's a few weirdos out there that are pretty interesting. Some of them less luminous than we expect them. I'm going to come back to that. For example, the 1991T was a pretty interesting event because it really challenged our understanding of type 1A supernova in terms of luminosity. But most of them are normal. And then you have type 1 BCs. Remember, type 1 BCs are the ones that either like hydrogen or helium or both. Uh, and most of them like both. So there, there's an efficient mechanism in binary stellar evolution that seems to remove, in most cases, both the hydrogen and the helium from the star that produces that one C supernova. Uh, and in type, of, in type 2 supernova with hydrogen, most of them we see come from red supergiant stars. Because if you remember from, uh, from the first lecture, the higher you go in mass, the less stars you have. It's kind of like the pebbles in the beach example. There's, more, there's a lot of small rocks and a few bigger rocks. So the bigger you go in mass, then you're going to start seeing those very, very special types. Type 2 and supernova, which correspond to the brightest ones. But most stars, even the massive stars, will be around 8 to 15 solar masses. So naturally, those will produce a red supergiant, as I said before, a very extended star, which is going to make a type 2 peak supernova explosion. So those are some supernova demographics. And then what's left behind? And going back to pretty pictures, type 1a, type 2. Well, again, we haven't been able to, think, to find a remnant for type 1a supernova. But we think type 1a supernova are produced by binary stellar evolution. Therefore, if they're produced by binary stellar evolution, we should be able to find a companion star. What happened to the other star that, tra that transferred the mass to the white one in the first place? Well, we haven't been able to find that either because it's pretty, pretty dim. We don't yet have the technology. We think the reason we haven't found the companion stars is because we don't have yet technology to go that deep in luminosity. But that discussion of whether there's a companion or not has opened up a huge debate in modern theoretical astrophysics about the projectors of type 1A. And I'm going to come back to lecture 3 on that. So I said that type 1A are the result of binary evolution. It's a white dwarf explosion due to mass transfer. There's people that say that's what happens. You have a white dwarf and you have a red giant star that transfers mass and eventually blows up. But there's another important faction, a fraction of people in astrophysics that believes that no, 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 you have a binary, yes, you do have a binary uh, system, but the other star is not a red super giant. It's also a white dwarf. So you have two white dwarfs orbiting against each other, eventually colliding with each other, coalescing, producing these events. The two main ideas for the progenitors of type 1 supernova, still a hot subject of debate in uh, astrophysics. Now, type 2 supernova occur from massive stars, uh, and they will produce either compact neutron stars, the LTM pulsars, the story I told you earlier, or in the most extreme and massive cases, black holes, one of the biggest mysteries in the universe. So you get to the point where your gravity is so strong after you collapse that not even light can escape your surface. And therefore, since light can't escape, you can't see anything, it looks black. And the black hole information paradox is anything that falls to a black hole, we can't receive any information about it. There are some new theories that believe maybe you can decode some information based on outside characteristics. But this is one of the biggest mysteries. The laws of physics as we know it break down in the centers of the singularities in the centers of black holes. Still a, a very huge subject of theoretical physics at this point of debate. <coughs> so, just to summarize everything we learned today, supernova are pretty diverse objects. I want you to remember that. And broadly, you can break them down into categories the ones that have hydrogen, the ones that don't have hydrogen, type 1As and type 2s. Type 1As usually occur from older stellar populations, they take longer time for them to evolve, and they come from binary systems, from the explosion of a white dwarf. Whereas type 2 supernova explosions, they come from the death of a single massive star forming an iron core, core collapse supernova. Now each type comes with subtypes. So in some cases you see hydrogen, in some cases you see, you don't see hydrogen, you see helium. So you have type 1b, type 1c supernovae. Uh, in some cases you see very prominent emission lines. You have type 2n supernova, interacting supernovae different kinds of animals. Uh, and what powers most supernova, important point, is the radioactive decay of nickel. The more nickel you produce, the brighter your supernova is going to be. 
Uh, the nickel decays down to cobalt, it decays down to iron, it produces gamma rays that thermalize, that heat up supernova ejecta. Uh, most supernova producers are irregular and spiral galaxies, irregular and more rare than uh, spiral, so we do tend to see more in spiral, but when irregulars decide to produce supernova, they tend to produce pretty luminous ones, pretty interesting. And when it comes to what's left behind, Type 1 A supernovae, we haven't yet been able to discover, the re to find a remnant for type 1 A supernova, but we do very frequently find compact neutron stars or the implications of the presence of the black hole, of the black hole itself. We can't see it, as I said, but the implications of its presence, by the gravitational effects it has, nearby objects for type 2 core collapse supernova. Thank you very much. What, what's the difference between a nova and a supernova? Let's repeat the question. He's asking what the difference is between a nova and a supernova. So, a supernova is a catastrophic terminal event. There's no turning back. So once a star explodes, it's gone. It's either going to be totally disrupted or it's going to leave a remnant. A nova, however, it's an event that can occur over time. For example, there will be cases where you can transfer enough mass to the surface of a white dwarf at a lower rate. So the white dwarf is not going to like that. So it's just going to start complaining about it. By complaining, I mean it's going to start puffing it out. It's like, don't give me enough. I don't want that mass. I don't want this. Take it out. So it will make bursts, luminous bursts. And then you're going to start giving it more mass. It's going to make another burst. But you don't destroy the white dwarf yet. It's just a series of bursts, of luminous bursts, because you're providing material that makes the white dwarf unstable temporarily. Once it becomes terminally unstable by blowing the entire white dwarf up, that's when you have supernova. And supernova, of course, tend to be brighter than novae, by far. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned a different thing you can measure in light of this one. Can you heard about it? I'm wondering whether the cubes measure the correlation. Are you taking a question? Is it the correlation effects in the intensity of light? Are these measurements made? The correlation affects the intensity of light. Uh, you mean the way light, light is uh, produced and propagated through the uh, material? No. It's correlated, it's tied to the matter. So you, you shouldn't think of, uh, of light as its own thing in astrophysics. You should always think of, of it as a, it, together with the matter it propagates into. So the interaction between light and matter is what? It's, it's, a, it's a real correlation that we try to understand the design and get information about the composition and the characteristics. Now, light itself is not going to, I mean, it's going to scatter in particles, it's going to diffuse the matter, but it's not going to really interact with other light, not really, not really. That's what we're talking about. Maybe you can kind of make any analysis for it, which means across the No, it's, it's, it's really more straightforward than that in our case. In our case, what we really care about is uh, we don't do those correlations because they're not as valid as those describing. What we're doing here is we're focusing on <coughs> deciphering the internal structure of supernovae, and that's the only way we can do this is by understanding how light correlates with how interacts with different elements along the way and how much light we move. So it's not very right. Yes, sir. The disproportionation of the hydrogen is added. Is this fixed strictly a gravitational effect or are there other mechanisms? So he's asking whether um, uh, the transfer of helium and hydrogen to the companion is strictly a gravitational uh, effect or there's other mechanism. Very good question, sir. So in most cases it is it is gravitational. You pull them close together, so you naturally start transferring. So there's, there's a but, difference. Okay. But in most cases it's the way you just said. But there's a few cases where you have two stars orbiting around Saturn, but they have really strong magnetic fields. So you kind of form a magnet. You've seen how magnetic lines connect between the North and the South Pole. So in some cases, you can have a funneling of material due to magnetic forces instead of gravity. But that's more rare. It happens, but it's way more rare than the gravitational. Thank you. Yes? 
Yes, sir. stages of the universe is still a question we're trying to understand. We can tell you how many we think there are in the galaxy, approximately, the orders of a few, you know, thousands of tens of thousands, because there's only a few massive stars that produce them. But the more you go far away uh, in the universe, it's harder to, to know. We think, however, that the first stars that were formed after the universe was created, after the Big Bang, were really massive. Way more massive than so. I've been talking about the Peebles idea that most stars are low mass and they are in the present day that we live in. But back in the day, after the universe was formed, the picture was entirely different. You could collapse really big collapse of material, create really massive stars. We're talking hundred thousand times the mass of the sun. Those will produce black holes. They will produce the first black holes of the universe, primordial black holes. And we're still, that's one of the biggest questions we're trying to understand. Like, well, what's the distribution of black hole masses along the, in the past of the universe? In all those days. Yes? You mentioned that in, we're due for a supernova here in the Milky Way. Right. Um, when it does occur, and obviously it's happened in the past, if it happens over 20 years, it should be obvious to just be able to see it. Yeah, depending on where you are in the Earth, you know, uh, people in the Northern Hemisphere will have different... Uh, should be a good show. Yeah. Now, if it turns into a pulsar... You could, should be able to see it in the daytime. Right, because it's super, like you yeah. said, so many yeah. of times brighter than, than, than a galaxy. Um, but if it turns into a pulsar with the, with the burst coming towards the ah, Earth, ah. how many problems do we have then? Uh -huh. <laughs> see, wait until lecture five. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys figure out the statistics of all this. One it's pretty small chance. You're talking about a supernova beaming directly towards the Earth. I'm talking about the pulsar. Yeah, exactly. But it, it's, it's, a, it's going to be a gamma ray burst. It's going to be dangerous. Really? Yeah. And the, uh, and the, the chances. chances on that happening are so, what is the chance if I just light up my, my laser right now? It's going to hit your eyeball if I do that. Pretty small. Right. Yeah, so the chances of, of having a star beaming directly towards the Earth, even if it's in our own galaxy, are very, very, very tiny. But if it happens, we're done. <laughs> we're done. We're done. <laughs> Our satellites are gone. Our electrical systems are gone. We're gone. No, no. Those don't. Those don't matter. Earth is fried. Earth is fried. Yes. Very good. Well, that's really tough. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that when we explode, we only see for like about two weeks with our naked eyes here on Earth. No, no, no. Yeah. It depends on how far away it is. Oh, uh, yes. That's right. right. With the aid of our right. visual aid. Okay, so um, at what rate is, is, is all this matter and light escaping? Is it escaping or radiating at, at the speed of light, or is it, is it going down? So, exactly at what rate is the light escaping uh, from a supernovae explosion that we've seen in, through the course of two weeks? Well, uh, light will always travel at the speed of light. So, once it escapes, once it escapes the supernova, it's going to you know, have the speed of light. But even while it's going through the supernova, it's going to have a speed really, 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 really close to the speed of light. So the way you transfer information is by the speed of light in this case, always. Okay, so then. But the rate that you produce the energy with the gamma rays is actually pretty constant. So the rate, we know from laboratory experiments, nuclear bomb experiments here in the Earth, how long it takes on average, what's the half time, half life time of nickel to decay. So this is pretty standard. We know what the decay of nickel is going to do over time. It's on the average between you know, 88 to 122 days. So this is the rate. Every, 100, every 122 days, your, your input energy from nickel is going to drop by half, for example. That's what that is. That's the rate of That explains the rapid decay. Exactly. And eventually, eventually uh, and I'm going to get back to light curve later, when you see the light curve, in the end, you will see that it tends to be pretty straight, constant decay. This is where you you really transparent to the core of the supernova, what's in the center of the supernova, and you directly see nickel decline, basically, at this constant rate. Okay. Yeah? Following on that question, wouldn't the supernova kick out a lot of Cherenkov radiation? A, a lot of what? Cherenkov radiation. Because you're going to have materials that are accelerated 
through other materials, possibly relativistic speeds faster than the light itself would be. It's not so very good question, sir. It's not really so. He's asking whether uh, I, I'm going to be repeating the questions for people to understand. But so he's asking whether uh, Cherenkov of radiation uh, due to the acceleration of material radiation here be produced. Uh, well, it's not. So, so Cherenkov radiation becomes efficient when you, you have a really, really rapidly accelerating material, not just light. The light, of course, is always fast. In the case of supernova, it's pretty fast, but it's not relativistic in most cases. So supernova will, will expand at a rate of, say, uh, on average, 1,000 to 10,000 kilometers a second. That's still way, you know, way below 300,000 kilometers a second for a speed of light to talk about this. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you this question. There's a terminology you use. I use at the beginning of this series. That is light. May you uh, help us understand the connection between light and this, and what is exactly during the light? Well, yeah. Uh, that's, that's a philosophical question, uh, but it's, it's related to what we're doing. Uh, life is, they, actually it's funny, biologists don't have a formal definition of life. So what they tend to say when you ask a biologist, which is the right discipline to answer this question, what is life, they say, well, complexity, you know. So it's, it's a complex process of matter rearranging itself to the point where it can reproduce itself at some level. And at a further level, it can think for itself. So if you think about it, and that's where supernova will come in, initially you have hydrogen helium, pretty boring, plain particles, uh, atoms. Those were combined to make stars. Now in stars, you have the right conditions to combine those to make iron, carbon, oxygen, silicon. And then stars will explode, and they will have even conditions, even better conditions to make uranium in the entire set of the elements. Eventually, those elements will be harvested by planets that are formed in the area where supernova takes place. And when they form, when they when they're harvested, you will have planets will have a lot of uh, silicon, carbon, and oxygen, and likely you will have this material protected from the destructive UV radiation of the sun, preferably in the bottoms of the ocean. And at this point, you have the right conditions to bring this material together over long periods of time and form the DNA molecule. And that's where you can say life was formed. That the DNA molecule is part of a, you know, it's going to be part of a cell that then starts splitting and creating two cells. So you have reproductive, reproductive activity going on. Uh, eventually, those cells will combine to make a more complicated organism. A shark, you know, it's a sea creature that will climb out of the water and evolve. You know, it's, so life is tied to supernova in the sense that we understand we can understand how those building blocks are produced, but then it's all a matter of the biologists to tell us how they combine and how they restructure themselves to what we know of life as today. Yeah. So you tie life to matter, something like that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You don't have life, you don't matter. For sure. We are building block, we can build it. Yeah? Uh, well, I noticed that sodium was in one of the charts for type 2 stars. So does that mean all type 2 stars produce sodium or? In different, uh, different quantities. In different quantities? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So if you see them, if you see this line being uh, more prominent, it means that they have more sodium than in some cases where it's weaker. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, one more question. I'm just thinking. Um, the elements that we know in the periodic table, are they that we actually made them, or not made them, we found them, or we got them from the spectrographs of the supernovas? Good question. He's asking the elements that we see in the periodic table. Yeah. Uh, are the elements that we manufacture, that we make, or we see them just through the spectrum of supernova? Well, uh, frankly, every element that I'm talking about exists in the Earth right now, because the supernova took place billions of years ago, enriched the space where the Earth and the Sun and the, the solar system was formed, and therefore you just see remnants. So we can find gold. That gold that I have in my ring was produced in a supernova explosion billions of years ago. So every element that we can see and identify 
through uh, observational spectra of supernovae, yeah. we can actually see it in the Earth, and we can study it in our laboratory. And this was the, that was very important because that allowed us to match those spectral lines I talked about, the emission lines, to the ones we see. If we didn't have a frame of reference, if we didn't know what element produces a specific line, we wouldn't be able to say what the composition of supernovae are. The fact that we have them here on Earth, and we can put them in a laboratory, and we can shine them with light, and lasers, and figure out uh, how they uh, absorb light, allows us to be able to calibrate and use, use them to understand. And there aren't any unknowns, like there's more elements out there because they well, uh, there are, we don't know what this is. There could, I mean, if you, if you want to talk about dark matter, there could be. There you go. Yeah, if you want to talk about that, there could be material that we That's still right, so. haven't understood yet how it's going. Now we're getting, we're making progress uh, in CERN, in big uh, laboratories and accelerators where people are producing uh, the conditions that we think will form dark matter. But it's really hard to study because it doesn't interact with light. You can only see the gravitational effects. Now, uh, it, it needs to be said that, and this is where light itself changes things. Nature provided us with a set of the elements in the periodic table, but because of our intelligence and our evolution, we're able to form even more complicated elements in our laboratories. So if you look at the periodic element, you will notice there are some elements with three U's. U, 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 U. Those are the elements we manufacture in the laboratories. So we're able to even you know, mess with matter itself. Yeah? Yeah, where do hypernovas come into this? Hypernovae are a much more energetic and luminous version of the supernovae. Uh, they usually are related to stars that are more massive than the ones I'm talking about here, you know, 20, 30 solar masses. And they're also usually uh, related to stars that rotate very fast. And that's important. Again, I'm going to come back to that in a later lecture. But rotation will have an effect on how do you emit that radiation in the form of is it coming out in a symmetric way or is it coming out beamed towards you? So hypernovae will be related to really massive stars, uh, produce a lot of nickel, for example. And they're mostly uh, prevalent in the early states of the universe. We expect to find a lot of hypernovae uh, if we look back far, far away, billions of light years away, which means we're looking billions of years in the past from the first stars. Yeah? Um. Maybe I'm a little ahead of myself here, but uh, we know, of course, the Earth is, uh, the solar nebula was impregnated with uh, supernova remnants. Right. Um, somewhere in that blizzard of information to see about these things, uh, I think I read that uh, uh, there's the imprint of maybe as many as five different supernovas in, in solar nebula. Could be, yeah. I mean, uh, people are still debating that, but if you imagine that you usually, as I said before, uh, form stars are in pockets of gas that are approximately the same region. It's natural to assume that the stars that were formed there, if there's a few massive stars, exploded in the same territory, thereby enriching this neighborhood of the galaxy with their own image. But at the same time, they will be very similar because they were born out of the same materials and have similar masses, but will produce more or less the same abundances of materials that will uh, enrich the Earth and the solar system. Nation. Yeah. Going back to the question <clears throat> about life, what it is, and that we've been looking for life outside. Yeah, yeah. Is it possible and has it been studied that in fact we could transfer life from our planet to another body with our objects that we have in space? Well, we, we start, <laughs> there's a pretty funny cartoon that I recently seen, my girlfriend said it to me. <laughs> Uh, but we have actually, uh, we're, we're worried that we might have already transported uh, bacteria to Mars. You know, when we, when we make spacecrafts, uh, it usually happens in a very clean environment, a clean laboratory, but it can never be that clean that not even a few, a small population of bacteria, you know, if, if, if a researcher accidentally touches his skin on a, on a piece of material, you know, there will be some bacteria transported to, to that vehicle. And a lot of the material, we're finding out, they're very, very resistant to extreme conditions. You can sign them with UVs, you can sign, you know, you can put them in low temperatures, high temperatures. A lot of them are going to survive. Uh, so we start wondering now, there's actually uh, a lot of discussion whether NASA has contaminated, you know, Mars with uh, Earth bacteria and whether they can survive in that environment. 
It's a big discussion. Yes, <clears throat> you said that uh, we detect uh, polarized light from a uh, supernova. And I think you said that the light was emitted polarized. Yes. It comes uh, out after it leaves the supernova. It okay. comes out. It's not, it's not due to be, being reflected? Yes. So Ro is asking uh, whether the polarization we see from supernovae uh, is due to the reflection of the, of the light, the last surface of the supernova towards us. And the answer is yes. By the time, you know, so if I were to draw your image, uh, by the time you produce uh, light here, it's going to really do that. It's going to scatter, it's going to interact with a lot of particles really fast, though. And eventually, it's going to get out here at the edge of the supernova. It's going to stream out the speed of light. So by the time it gets there, at this point, this is the last point where it interacts with the matter of the supernova. And that carries the information of polarization. How, how much polarization, how much was it polarized here before it left the supernova? But when it's emitted, can it be polarized? When it's emitted, it depends. So we usually detect polarization around supernova that there's not much intervening material between us and the supernova. In some cases, it's really hard because you have really dense clouds of material intervening between us and the supernova, and they will influence the polarization on the way to the Earth. However, in most cases, we're able to remove those effects because we can measure the, the individual polarization of the inter intervening material, and we can subtract it from the original polarization of the star. Therefore, we can deduce what the polarization of supernovae are, even if light comes through complicated uh, material. But in most cases, we've been lucky, actually, you know, where there's not much intervening matter, especially for galactic or you know, near, near the galactic neighborhood uh, supernovae. And we can see directly uh, to the supernova. There's not much absorption. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.